Welcome back at WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. I'm wearing the hat. We are merging the brands. No better time to do that when Patrick Mahomes is coming to town without my barbecue and my onion rings. And I can't think of Kansas City without thinking about my original Kansas City friend. And, I, and my friends at, at Raskin Global, I gave Atlanta Raskin a hard time this week saying I'm wearing my royal blue. But uh, this guy uh, wore royal blue, and I would say that no one wore it better, but he would even agree that George Brett probably wore it better. Uh, Jeff Montgomery, uh, former teammate of George Brett, and a longtime friend of mine and former guy that we once uh, wore kiss makeup together at a kiss show at the Baltimore Civic Center uh, back in the 1990s. Joins us from uh, HB Kansas City and resident Kansas City and Fox Sports Kansas City and um, our first ever Zoom together. I can see how good you look in your Rolates fireman relief. <laughs> Monty, thanks for bringing me into the Monty basement there in Kansas City, man. Hell, you're welcome. Glad to be a part of it. It's just been a, a really, really weird uh, summer for me doing uh, Royals TV, uh, but gotten certainly used to doing a lot of Zoom calls, probably at least two, maybe sometimes three Zoom calls a day. So welcome to my world. I'm right in your world. Well, you know, for, for where we are and the Royals coming in, and I don't know if people know, but uh, and you can give your whole background because I remember picking you up in a car uh, and, and we went to Amici's. Still one of my sponsors, one of the great places on earth, uh, one of my favorite places. And you and I had lunch at Amici's back in the mid-90s, and you, you pulled out a, – a, you had a, a laptop before anybody had laptops. <laughs> and, um, and you pulled it out and showed me that you were going to be involved in a sports radio business. And here we are 25 years later. Brian Billix, my partner here. Obviously, tough times for AM radio stations. I'm making a, a major move, but – little background on your commitment to Kansas City and your love of Kansas City sports. And um, you were loving the Chiefs even when you were pitching for the Royals, man. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting you mentioned a laptop. I, my claim to fame is I think I'm the first Major League Baseball player to ever be on the Internet. So um, I went to school at Marshall University, and I got my computer science degree. I went back after my first couple minor league years and finished up my degree, but I always had that interest in electronics and technology. Hey, and hang on a second. You were the first human being to ever show me a picture of your family on a screen. I'm not <laughs> lying. Like, I'm thinking about this because I'm thinking about that day we were together and you had this gadget and you're like, oh, this is my wife. And you were like, show me. Because most people pulled that out of their wallet, right? They had like a picture. They pulled like the, oh, this is my kid's picture, right? And you, but you had it like on a thing. And I was like, that's the damnedest thing, you know, I mean, and you were a baseball player making a few more dollars than me, but I thought, man, that's a gadget right there. That's going to catch on. Well, it, it did catch on. And here's the interesting thing. Now I've got four grandchildren and my two year old grandson, he can show me pictures on his gadgets. So that's how far we've advanced with regards to the It's technology. the Jetsons, dude. We're doing, we're doing television right now. Who knew, right? Yeah. Could barely yeah, do it's radio. Great to be, uh, you know, be in sports and have a career as a player. Uh, that seems like ancient history now, but, um, you know, still, you know, a big fan and I've been doing Royals television now for 11 seasons. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, really wish I could get back to those times like 2014 when we traveled through Baltimore for those uh, playoff games. I don't know how far both the Royals or the Orioles are away from that those days again, but hopefully they're going to at least uh, have a chance to, to do those type of fun postseason things at some point in the near future. Uh, but also a big Chiefs fan. I've season ticket holder for years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when they did a renovation at the at Arrowhead, oh, it must have been 10, 12, 13 years ago, uh, I opted out of my, uh, my season tickets, but I still keep up with them and watch them on TV and every once in a while make it out to a ball game. Well, they rocked your town on the way the Royals rocked your town. I guess the big picture is I met you in 1993 – uh, I guess the all-star game, I think is where I met you and you were kind of hanging out with Getty Lee, as I remember it. And I was jealous, still am. Um, and you know, all of these years later, the baseball thing here was so massive, right? And you were a part of that in the times when, you know, giving a guy like me a couple of tickets to bring a girl to the game was a big deal in 1993 because you couldn't get tickets. Uh, you bring my son to the game or whatever. And, 
where it's gone, all these years, you and I singing the blues about how awful it was for Kansas City, how awful it was in Baltimore. You and I would get together every summer and do a little bit of radio together, and the Royals were going to be 60-something and something-something, and the Orioles were going to be 50-something, something-something. And then the magic happened, right? I mean, your city caught fire and Yost and Showalter and uh, players and the Moustakases and the Canes and all of that stuff, Osmers. And now it's gone again, right? So the promise of all of it for building it and keeping it around, I was so disappointed to see how quickly it dissipated in your town, even after you had a couple of really magical years where I put a Royals game in and all of a sudden it's the friends and family plan again that people stopped going. And quickly, way more quickly than when I pulled out of the parking lot that night after the sweep. And even Luke and I, you know, shed a tear for you guys because it was such an incredible night that night. at Royal. I saw you that night. I remember I saw you on the way out. And to see your city have that moment, we're going to the World Series, we beat the Orioles. I mean, we got our butts kicked and I didn't even feel bad about it because your town's a special town. I think you know that. Well, the interesting thing about baseball is it's so cyclical. And if you're a, you know, a small to mid-market club, you have to find ways to, to really kind of build your club through your farm system. And I remember when the Royals general manager, Dayton Moore, was hired in 2006. He said, people aren't going to like what I'm going to say here, but this takes about eight years to build from the bottom up. And sure enough, it was 2014, eight years later, uh, when the Royals made their first World Series appearance in 29 seasons. So... Uh, unfortunately, it only lasted a few years, uh, and I guess the good part is in 15, they were able to capture that title, but uh, it's, it's very cyclical, and I think that's one thing our general manager uh, has said over the last two or three seasons, that, hey, we did a really nice job and something magical in bringing you know, a, a title here in 2015, but the thing he's disappointed in is the fact that he was not able to keep that, that winning uh, group of guys together and continue to build and, and win. They kind of put all the chips in the middle of the table for the World Series title in 15 and, and left with a lot of nothing afterwards. So uh, back in that process again, and like most good organizations, I feel pretty confident that um, they'll have a chance to be uh, at the top again in the next couple of years. Yeah, I called you to talk Chiefs and Mahomes and all that, and, I, and we'll get to that. But I want to stay on baseball a minute. Jeff Montgomery, our guest, uh, a former all-star pitcher. You can see his Roll Age Relief Award behind him, which is really cool, by the way, of all the, the great awards. It stands out, has some color. I, I saw Ripken's living room a couple weeks ago. You got better stuff, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, if on the baseball side, and what happens when you have – a Hosmer Kane Mustakas. What happens when you have a Machado, uh, a Marcakis, a Weed? You know, whoever, whoever the guy, Adam Jones, whoever the guys you want, then you then make that commitment or you don't make that commitment. And it feels like the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Red Sox and, you know, these teams that spend, 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 Cubs at one point. I, I mean, even the Cubs fell apart on the backside of that. Their fan base has and, and the experience at Wrigley Field and what they built around there and what's been left behind from all of it. And then you even got the Astros who now cheating, right? I was in Houston last week. I don't know the fallout of that, but there was Astro stuff everywhere. I mean, the, the, the rain that falls after the parade, right, uh, of, uh, of the couple of years you get. But then what happens after that? I mean, the Orioles had good teams here and Buck and all of that. Now they're going to lose 100 for a couple of years. And part of that is they decided not to sign Machado. And the Ro Royals decided – who they're going to invest in, who they're not going to invest in, or we're small market, we're not going to invest at all, right? And just resign to the fact that you're going to burn it back down again and we're going to have to build it back up again. That is so not um, – if you had to do that in your sports radio business or I had to do that in my business, say we're going to suck for five years and it's just going to be – there's our, a restaurant. There's no other business that in America that says we're going to tear it down for a while and you're going to pay full price. Yeah, it's a very difficult model uh, to try to compete in and try to kind of stay alive in. And we have a new owner in Kansas City. Uh, our, our previous owner sold last year about this time he announced he was going to sell the club. And I feel so, uh, so, for, you know, so sad for our new owner who you know, buys a ball club right before the pandemic and now playing baseball with a team that's not playing well in the field, plus no fans in the stands. So just a financial, uh, you know, I guess, beating that you're taking. But it is, it's, it's a really difficult model uh, when you have to look at uh, really only 
probably a handful of teams legitimately going into a season have a chance to win a World Series. Well, and here we are, and the reason we're together this week, and it ain't nothing to do with the Royals or the Orioles or playoff games. It's the National Football League, right? And as an athlete, as an invested sports business owner in a town that they just won the Super Bowl, you just won the World Series. I mean, this is as good as it's going to get in Kansas City, right, the last couple of years. And then COVID sets in. And on the back end of whatever things that would have been happening and stories that would have been told and feeling good about all of that, everyone hermits down. You open the stadium two weeks ago, um, hang a banner for, for almost no one, for a handful of people. Um, it harkened back to us winning the Super Bowl and having our baseball owner forbid the football team from celebrating. And, you know, I, I saw that the Royals were willing to get out of the way to allow the Chiefs to have – they had to get out of the way. It was the same parking lot, right? The Royals originally had a game schedule for that Thursday night, um, and it was a tepid celebration at best. But going into the season, knowing where Mahomes is, he signed the champagne story, all that stuff, they struggled against the Chargers. But, but Monday night here, this is going to be the biggest football game of the year, right? It's going to be huge. And I know, you know people have been gearing up, and a lot of people have been talking about maybe – the Chiefs were looking a little past the Chargers toward the Ravens because it is going to be such a big game and obviously on the big spotlight with regards to playing on Monday night football and you know two of the best quarterbacks in football head-to-head -head against each other. It's, it's going to be one of those games that could have a huge factor on who's going to be playing uh, in, in the Super Bowl again this year. And I think you know when you look at uh, – I mean, I'll, I'll speak first on, on the Chiefs, what they were able to do – um, to, to run the table last year when the, when the Ravens got knocked off, uh, to me, that was a huge bonus or benefit, you know, for the Chiefs not to have to go through the Ravens who they'd beaten earlier in the season last year, but that was going to be one of those games last year was probably going to determine who's going to win the Super Bowl. Now the Chiefs didn't play well in the first half of the Super Bowl, but uh, Mahomes has that magic and we know certain players and certain teams, uh, they just have the ability to do special things when they're needed. Yeah. Well, he's a son of a baseball player. What would you expect, right, Monty? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I always say, you know, the, they're winners and they're losers. Now, you have to learn how to win. And when you learn how to win, that's a huge advantage. You talked about some of those players the Royals had and some of those players the Orioles had, the Machados and the Marquecas and here are the Hosmers and Moustakas and Canes. You know, those guys had to learn how to win. Uh, some teams play good enough to lose and some teams play good enough to win. But the teams that are – you know, cracking the champagne open. Those are teams that have found ways along the way that they've learned how to win. And, they're, and as a result, they're true winners and they are champions. Well, his father was a contemporary of yours. I mean, you, do you have any Mahomes family stories or, uh, you know, the story of the day he got drafted? I mean, he's a legend now, right? I mean, he, he did what nobody's been able to do since Len Dawson. You've been kicking around Kansas City for 30 years now, and the disappointments of the Lynn Elliotts and the Montanas and the Bono, all the things that went on there, Schottenheimer's era, a lot of winning across the parking lot from where you played baseball, um, more winning than you did uh, as a baseball but but never but always a January bridesmaid, right? Literally. Yeah, I mean, just the inability to to win games once you get to the postseason, inability to win games. I don't remember the streak, but the Chiefs have played a large number of games in the postseason before they ever won another football game. So that was a huge step. But again, that's to me part of the process from an organizational standpoint of learning how to win. Andy Reid obviously has been a huge factor for the Chiefs. Uh, his experience and his, you know, all he's done postseason, but he had to find a way to learn how to win the big one. And finally was able to get that done. Jeff Montgomery, our guest Fox sports uh, South and in Kansas city for all things, man, I had a Costas crab cake with your name on it for that championship game. You know, I'm, I know everybody's going to be flying in from Kansas city. You're going to bring me some barbecue and some onion rings, some Jack stack and whatnot. Um, and it didn't, the fact that these guys haven't met in a playoff game, I, I look at, at Monday night, and from a fan's perspective, and I went to Houston on Sunday, and the strangest thing that I didn't think about until the game really got going and play happened was how much easier it was for Lamar Jackson to operate than it ever would have been if fans were there. We've played out there two years. I was out there last year for the, uh, the, the late game and all that stuff. 
the stadium being empty is such a benefit to Mahomes and the Chiefs and Andy Reid coming in here, especially this stadium, no different than your stadium. We were playing out there. It's really weird to see Vegas put point spreads up on, like, who's home and who's away. And I know you would make a case for getting on an airplane, staying in a hotel, the whole deal. But there is a case for on the first third and six for Mahomes on Monday night. It's a much different kind of job offensively and in that environment than it would have been. And that's one of the weird little parts of home field advantage that was such a benefit in the National Football League that I think has been sort of, you know, nullified for the time being. Yeah, and I agree. And I think, you know, if you look at it, I'll make a comparison on the baseball side of things. You know, Tampa Bay, you know, they're going to win their, their division. Um, they're used to playing in empty stadiums. So I think when, when teams are – used to having that huge advantage, like in the National Football League with the fans, like you have in Baltimore, like they are uh, here in Kansas City in Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, I think the fact that you don't have them, it takes away a huge uh, portion of that home field advantage. And that's one reason I think the Rays, uh, given the fact that they have a you know, tremendous pitching staff as well, but um, the Rays were able to kind of go about their business. It was normal to them to be playing in front of stadium, you know, in stadiums in front of hardly any fans. So I, I think that's one reason the Ray, or the uh, Tampa Bay Rays had such a good baseball season was that it was business as usual to most of their players, whereas a lot of teams like the Yankees, for example, you know, that was a huge advantage when you, know, you have all those fans out, you know, making the chance in right field for, the, for, the, for Aaron Judge and just all the things that uh, some of the home field advantages provide, uh, you know, on an emotional basis for baseball players. So, yeah, I agree. I think the uh, – the fact they're playing in front of either empty or almost empty stadiums, uh, huge impact on, you know, the home field or lack thereof. I feel like I'm asking a real expert as I look over your shoulder and see the Roll Aids Relief Award because, like, you came in in the ninth inning with, like, a, you know, 7-2 to lead in Oakland some nights, I'm sure, and it probably – other than hearing the peanut vendor or whatever, probably gone in the ninth inning, right? Like, you came into some pretty empty ballparks, I would think, after rain delays in certain nights in the Midwest, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's, it's such a different um, – I think, I think what happens is, you know, the, the fans provide that, that spark for a player to get locked in, to get, you know, that laser – like focus on what his job's going to be, whether it to be deliver a pitch or to throw a pass or whatever it is. I think the fans kind of provide that additional element of urgency. And when it's empty, it's just, it's really not there. And I know for me as a pitcher, a guy who's used to pitching in normally fairly close games, game on the line, uh, I was better in those games than I was in those seven to two or 11 to one ball games when I'm all doing it. I'm getting some work in. I'm getting trying to get three outs to get the game over with. So I'm staying sharp in case it's a three to two game tomorrow night. But so, but yeah. you but the point is taken that one night you're in Detroit and nobody's there and it's 28 degrees, and another night you're on a lousy team but you can screw up the Red Sox and you come in with a three two lead in the ninth to to push them out of the wild card. And Fenway's on fire. I mean, th there really is a wild difference in what any athlete could hear. But in the National Football League, it's hell every week. You know, I mean, for every quarterback, every you know, Troy Aikman went into New York or Washington or Philly. That was the same story, right? right. And, and I, I think for golfers, and I mean, I, I know you like tennis too, right? I mean, these more quiet sports, everything becomes a quiet sport. And, Monty, I'm going to tell you when – when the Stanley Cup playoffs began in the middle of August or whatever the hell it was, and it's they're in a in a in a blimp with you know with trash bags up and it was very very difficult for me to think like to get my head space into this is real you know and I, I've heard the stories of the players and the athletes on the inside. Are you shocked that they're playing? I mean, is there, was there a point in any of this where you thought none of this was going to happen? Because I think for most of us, this has been an extraordinary six-month period in all of our lives, especially guys our age, right? Yeah, it has. And, and really, to me, with regards to the teams playing, I'm really happy that they – that at least – you know, being involved in baseball, I'm really happy they played. Now, was it the same? Absolutely not. Um, 
as a broadcaster, I would go to the ballpark every night. It didn't matter if the Royals were playing in Kauffman Stadium or if they're on the road playing against the Detroit Tigers. We're doing our broadcasts from that from our ballpark, 100% of our broadcasts. That's what Ben McDonald and everybody did here in Baltimore too, yeah. Yeah, so it's really, really unusual. Uh, you couldn't see fly balls on the road if you're calling a game, right? Right. It was hard. I mean, it was, it's, they, they, it, it, it created some unusual circumstances. Now, the thing I did like about it, it, it did provide opportunities, and especially across the board, I think every team probably had more players that made their major league debut than any year I can ever remember in, in, a, in, you know, in a short season. But it gave some young players an opportunity and allowed some players to develop. So it didn't really kind of put baseball on hold or standstill for an entire, you know, almost two-year period. Uh, like it maybe it did at Arkansas or in college places, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's going to affect everything behind this. Yes. Yeah, and it, but I'm 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 happy they did. I'm really surprised they were able to play the whole season. Knock on woods, five games left to go. But I was really impressed with the way the players handled you know the the situation with the coronavirus. Now had the breakouts when, you know, early in the season, that first week, I thought, gosh, here we are with the first weekend of the season. And you've got, you know, teams like the Marlins and the, you know, the Cardinals. And I think there were some things in Philadelphia. There were just, there were all these issues with the number of teams. I'm thinking this thing is going to blow up before it really even kind of gets off the ground. But sure enough, the players, I think they recognize the fact that, hey, we have to be diligent in what we're doing here. Otherwise, you know, this is all going to go away and the players get paid per game. You know, so the the more games they pay, they, they, they play, the, the more money they're going to make. So I think they took it to heart and they, um, they really embraced the situation and, and, and did everything they could to make sure the season made it through. And I gave it less than a 50% chance, especially after that first week. But sure enough, they're going to make it happen. And the NFL, I mean, you know, was making those decisions at that time. And just the fact that you and I are on a Zoom call together during a plague and they're actually playing on Monday, right? Like it's Mahomes, it's Lamar, it's Monday Night Football. It feels pretty safe for them. You know what I mean? It doesn't – so all, all of that being said, I've enjoyed the last two weeks of football. I really have. I know you've been on the baseball trail kind of with a bad team in a weird season in seven, eight games and guys on second base in the 10th inning. Hey, Monty, take the ball. Got a guy on second base. You, they did that. They paid you to do that professionally. <laughs> Uh, but uh, football it feels like and I hope we can get to a Super Bowl I don't know if we're going to be in Tampa you're going to be in Tampa I don't know whether fans are going to be in Tampa or whatever but it it has been one little nice ray of sunshine in eight months of despair to at least have football and good football in your town and our town they're not saying that in Cleveland or Philadelphia right now Monty but but th this this feels good for the fans in our city it really does well, I'm, I'm sure it does. Just like here, I know people were so anxious for uh, football to come around after, you know, the way that, you know, things ended for the Chiefs last year and the ability to recognize the players and the organization with their rings and, and, and kick things off. And I think they had about 20,000 fans out at the ballpark for the first game, uh, which, you know, seems like nothing compared to what they would normally have in an 80,000-seat stadium. But uh, it is what it is. But I think you know, the ability to turn it on, watch it on TV, uh, and, and, you know, see the people around town wearing their purple or wearing their red, uh, just getting into the, the spirit. It's something that's a tremendous release uh, for everyone who's been cooped up and quarantined and been through such a unique, uh, unfortunate experience in our lives over these last several months. So, you know, that's one thing that uh, sports can be. It can be a, a very nice distraction when it's needed. Hey, let me kick Houston in the nuts one more time on the way out the door. Yeah, I ask, tell me about cheating in baseball. Like, I, I don't think we talked about this at all. I didn't have you on the show this year because we never really got around to it or whatever. And I had a whole bunch of my old baseball bunkies on. I think Greg Olson came on. Some people talked to me about it. But I didn't call you. Thoughts on where the Astros are? Because I, I did find it peculiar being there. And every Astros fan I've talked to, it's almost like political. It's almost like talking to Patriots fans after Spygate. It's like there's no way Altuve was wearing a wire. They weren't really cheating. Those weren't really trash can. I mean, it's insane the level that they went to to cheat and how, yeah, they got their money, they got their rings, they got away with it, and how pissed you probably would have been in Kansas City if you were of that era to find out that there was institutional cheating. Right, and, and I think when you talk about – you know, trying to gain an advantage, you know, that's, 
that's part of what you do as an athlete. You, you look for every ability that you can do. And sometimes you may be, I don't know if I use the word crossing the line, but uh, as long as everybody has that same ability uh, to steal signs, you know, if you're on second base, if the catcher's you know, crazy enough to just put one finger down there, uh, those are all normal things. And everybody has that same level playing field in order to, you know, to compete at that level. And if you're not taking advantage of it, hey, shame on you. But when you go to the extreme measures and using the, uh, you know, the electronics and, you know, and, and, and using tools that other teams uh, didn't have the ability to utilize and, and putting yourself at a level above where everybody else is as a result of it, you know, to me, that would be, uh, that would be grounds for some pretty extreme actions as a player uh, to do whatever I could do to retaliate and, uh, and, and make it known that, Hey, if you keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it happened the way it was. Uh, but I think if you look to Astros record now, I think they're about a 500 ball club. Uh, now granted they've had some injuries, but I think it's really brought them back down, you know, to, to where they need to be. And, uh, you know, the, the punishment, the penalties, uh, I mean, if you look at it, the pandemic saved the Astros from a public standpoint, because I know back in December, January, that's all anybody wanted to talk about was, you know, what about the Astros? You know, what do you think about it? And it's just, it was amazing how the pandemic essentially kind of wiped all that attitude away. So it's, it's been probably much less of a repercussion um, than, than what would have normally occurred. But uh, yeah, as a player, it would have really chapped me to know that they went to those extreme measures to do what they could to, to get that advantage. Yeah, it really bothered me as a life for baseball fan. And it bothered me that it didn't bother everybody. You know what I mean? Like, it, like certain things politically that are going on with our guy. It, it bothers me that it doesn't bother everybody that cheating's okay if my team's doing it. If, it, if it's my team that's the crooked one and we win, we get to keep the championship, and you could call it crooked, but we're keeping the money in the parade. And I thought that that was just um, – and here in Baltimore, Monty, uh, you know, we hired those guys, Elias and Mydell, based on their acumen and their brilliance and, you know, um, and their genius and all that. And to find out that there was a band of cheaters and rogues that was winning it on the field, and what, whether they knew about it or didn't, there's a real sleaziness and a guilt by association that then leads to, well, are they really geniuses or not? And how does this work? And wh who else is cheating? I want to ask you this because, you know, all of this Astro Ball and all of the, 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 the saber that goes into this, you're around baseball all the time now, much more so than a lot of old pitchers I know. Does any of this strike you as would have been helpful to you? I mean, do, do you wish you were 21 again? and had all of this technology, would it, would it have changed your career? Because you were pretty good as it was. Well, here's the thing I've learned from talking with players, uh, current players, about the, uh, the technology and what's available. So, and I, and I think it would have been very useful, not necessarily to go out and get people out in ball games, but when you have some, uh, when you're going through some times of struggle, having those tools and mechanisms in order to help you get back on track. That's the thing that almost all the players have told me. They're, they're less concerned about all the numbers and all the analytics involved uh, when they're on the field between the white lines. But when you say during your bullpen session or during your batting practice session, they have these Rapsodo machines out, you know, tracking spin rate. And what it allows you to do is have a baseline. When things are going well, you know what your spin rate is, you know what your arm angle is, you know where your release point is, and you have all that information as a baseline. It's golf, to... literally, right? It's like, just like golf, right? Yes, yes. And when you start to struggle a little bit, you know, things go a little haywire. Sometimes it's, you know, it may be injury related, but sometimes it's just muscle memory, and sometimes it's getting away from your repeatable mechanics. But that's where the technology comes in. You can then go back to it and say, hey, let's take a look at this from when I was really on and, and use that technology to get back on track. And I, I remember back in the day, I, I had shoulder surgery in 96. And I, I made the all-star team uh, that season. So I was throwing the ball well the first half, but the second half, things were just going off the rails. I couldn't get anybody out. I was playing, I was playing catch with Tim Belcher. 
And he said, man, he goes, your arm is really dropping down. Your arm angle is way low compared to what it normally is. And I said, it doesn't feel like it. So you know what we did? We went in, we got a VHS tape of me pitching back in like April. And we got a VHS tape of me pitching in August. And we, we ran them side by side. You know what we did? We put a piece of tape on the monitor or on the television where my arm angle is, where it was in April. And the only way we could do it, then we can run the, the tape from August and see that my arm angle had dropped like four to five inches. And, and that was our technology. But I would have loved to have had the really uh, accurate, the really easy technology that's available today for situations like that. But I think there's way too much information uh, available. Uh, and I, I say it's like, paralysis by analysis. Sometimes they overuse the information and, and they, they probably take a few steps backwards as a result. Well, you can eliminate a bad habit pretty quickly then. Yes, indeed. But far quicker than four months later, like you had to back in the, <laughs> in the summer of 97. Uh, Jeff Montgomery is our guest. He's at WHB. He's at Fox Sports out in Kansas City. The, uh, the Chiefs are coming in, bringing Patrick Mahomes and uh, and Kelsey and, and Andy Reid and little Andy Reid, John Harbaugh uh, reunion on Monday night for Monday Night Football. It is always great to visit with you. I wish we were doing it over barbecue there or crab cakes here or uh, getting to the Jazz Museum or the, 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 the uh, Negro Baseball Hall of Fame and the museum that you guys have out there. I hope that all of that is still there and vibrant and wonderful. Um, and maybe I'll get to come to a playoff game in Kansas City. Maybe you'll get to come to one here. Uh, if you come here, I got crab cakes for you, Monty, all right? Well, if you come here, I have some barbecue for you. Well, there you go. You're always good for fattening me up. Take care of everybody out there. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. And uh, I, I would think we're going to be getting together in January and talking more about this. I have a pretty good feeling about that as well. I hope so. Jeff That's Montgomery, Fox Sports South, my uh, longtime friend, one of my oldest friends in doing this, literally all these years. I met Jeff Montgomery in 1993. I began my career in late 1991. And this week, we're moving into 3.0, you know, for the old AM sports radio show host guy. We're merging WNST.net along with Baltimore Positive, putting it all into one place where you'll be able to find all the old music interviews with David Bowie and uh, Clarence Clemens and Nils Lofgren, uh, as well as some old sports interviews with Ray Lewis and Artie Donovan and all sorts of stuff in one place. It's the new Baltimore Positive, and it's made possible by all of our sponsors. I got the guys from Taharka on this week. Uh, we're going to get the Victor Brick on to talk about the John W. Brick Foundation and the, the 5K that they keep putting off because it's crazy because of COVID. But Planet Fitness, give them some love and make sure you're uh, lining up your chicken. Get your uh, chicken together for Monday night at Royal Farms, real fresh, real fast. I am Nestor, nasty at WNST.net finds me. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, and anywhere the internet travels, we are WNST.net AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking. Baltimore positive.